I'm pretty excited to be here, to, sh to be sharing the stage with so many amazing speakers. Amy was amazing. It's going to be hard to follow up. So I want to thank you to the organizers uh, for bringing me out here. And today I'd like to share with everyone my journey of trying to figure out images on the web. You see, I have this annoying tendency to go down rabbit holes with things that seem rather straightforward at first, but then you get this little inkling that there's something more beneath the surface. So that, that's pretty much my relationship with images. And I'm, again, a very annoying person with an incessant need to ask why, like constantly. And that's why I love and appreciate everyone who's still willing to be friends with me at this point. Now, I've been working on the web for a couple of years now, and I learned. I learned that image optimization is one of the low-hanging fruits when it comes to web performance. Now, you may not be able to discern the exact numbers on this chart, but know that as page weight has steadily crept up over the years, images, on average, make up about 60% of that page weight. Image sizes matter, because sending smaller images of comparable quality to your users over the interwebs is not just the smart thing to do. It is the right thing to do. But images are not all created equal. Some image formats are better suited for certain purposes over others. JPEGs for photographs, choose pings over GIFs, don't use BNPs or TIFFs on the web at all. I know all of this as fact, but for quite a while, I didn't know why. And it ignored me enough until one day I decided to find out. My name is Hui Jing, you can also call me Jing, and this is me in emojis, make what you will of them. I understand that the fox may not be that obvious, but I use it to indicate that I am a Mozilla tech speaker, which is an initiative by Mozilla to support technical evangelists in regional communities around the world by providing resources and funding. And I also have a day job uh, as a developer advocate with Nexmo, Nexmo being a platform that provides APIs for messaging, voice, authentication, so developers can integrate communications into their own applications. Right. So, images, right? Image making seems to be emblematic of humanity, don't you think? I try to research if any other species creates images, and it seems that to date, no image making has ever appeared in the careers of primate artists, because they seem like the most logical next candidate besides human beings to do something like that, right? So let's talk a bit about prehistoric images, because I told you this was a rabbit hole. And the earliest images, they date back to the upper Paleolithic period, and some research has proposed that image making originated in the discovery of the representational capacity of lines, marks, and lots of color, and the act of image making seemed culturally agnostic. From Namibia to Tanzania, India to Brazil and Australia, it seemed that prehistoric humans were attempting to reproduce the three-dimensional, full-color world they lived in by making marks on the surfaces around them. And if you think about it, image making was an analog process for the longest time. A pigment on a surface, something physical, something you could touch. It was photography that brought light into the picture, but of course, the end result was still something persistent, something that you could hold in your hand, that you could come back to year after year, even after the photograph had yellowed and faded with time. The digital age is one of light and electronic signals, and perhaps it may be more apt to say of light created by electronic signals. Now, I've gone on and on about ancient art and photography, but really, today's story starts off with this little fella and what it represents. Meet Pixel. Not the Google phone, not that Pixel. Uh, this, this Pixel has been around for a lot longer than that phone. And Pixel is a pretty well-defined character. Multiple definitions, if you look around, but the most common one calls a Pixel the smallest unit of an image which can be displayed on a digital display device, the basic logical unit for representing digital graphics. Computers have come a long way in a relatively short period of less than 100 years, the earliest of them having displays that were more indicators of device health 
rather than program output. But those panels of light bulbs that allowed engineers to monitor the internal state of their machines eventually came to be known as monitors. I wish I had a symbol crash to go with that. Anyway, sorry. Electronic displays, though, they actually predate digital computers with cathode ray tube CRT technology becoming commercially available way back in 1922. Now, they worked by firing a beam of electrons onto a phosphor-coated screen, and the energy from these electrons get absorbed by the phosphor atoms on the screen and kicks them up to a higher energy level. And if you remember some high school physics, you may already know that such a high energy state is unsustainable. And the phosphor atoms will eventually come back down, releasing the extra energy in the form of light, resulting in a bright spot on the screen. Now, there are two modes for drawing computer graphics onto a screen. You could do a raster scan, where the electron beam is swept across the screen, one row at a time, from top to bottom. Varying beam intensity allows for a pattern of illuminated spots across the screen, and each of these screen points is known as a single pixel. Or you could do something called a random scan, which could generate vector graphics. And both types of scanning have their pros and cons. Back in the 70s, both raster displays and vector displays were used for computer graphics. And the relatively high price of memory back then made vector displays kind of more affordable. But by today, they've all practically been replaced by raster displays. And of course, these are merely the mechanics of how an image gets displayed on a screen. But before that, we must have image data. All digital files are really just long lists of numbers stored as binary on a storage device. And file formats are what allow us to read and understand the data these numbers represent. Operating systems and applications can use a number of methods to identify all these different file types. File name extensions are probably the most popular method used by most operating systems. Information about the file formats can also be explicitly stored in the file system instead of the file itself as external metadata. And files themselves will contain information about their own format as internal metadata. Such information is usually put at the beginning of the file as a file header or a magic number if it's only a few bytes long. Now, image files are a very particular type of file format, so their file headers would contain stuff like the image format, resolution, color space, authoring information, camera model. It's a really long list. And broadly speaking, there are two kinds of images, raster and vector. We'll be covering more on the raster side of things today. A raster image is also known as a bitmap image, which are comprised of pixels on a grid. And each pixel contains a bit of color information, a combination of the additive primary colors, red, green, and blue. A bitmap is essentially a spatially mapped array of bits, and the number of bits per pixel will determine how many unique colors the image can contain. And this is also known as color depth. Raster displays store per pixel image data as a bitmap in a region of memory called the frame buffer. So clearly, memory is an integral part of the rendering process. And the total amount of memory needed is dependent on the resolution of the output signal and the color depth. Now, before computers became a consumer product, each model pretty much had its own suite of software and file formats, which weren't all that interoperable. But when the Macintosh came out in 1984, the Mac Paint application introduced a well-defined and well-documented file format for saving image files created with it. And what's most notable about Mac Paint is that other applications could use the image files that it generated. On the Windows side of things, we had BNP, which was released in 1987. As a kid who grew up with Microsoft, shout out MS-DOS 6.0. Nobody? No? Hey. OK, just one person. That's fine. But I would say that this was the first image format that I ever encountered. I never had a Mac, so I never used Mac Paint in my life. It was MS Paint, back when it was called Paintbrush, for me all day, every day. And this is an example of a 4-bit BNP image, which means a given pixel can be one of 16 colors. Each color in the table is represented by a 24-bit hexadecimal number, eight bits each 
for red, green, and blue, respectively. And we can map each pixel to its corresponding color value based on the color table. Such bitmaps are called palette-indexed bitmaps. But some bitmaps can also store the colors themselves. The thing about BMP files is that they're usually not compressed, which make them not suitable for web use at all. Which brings us to the graphics interchange format, and whether you pronounce it GIF or GIF, what's not up for debate is that this was the first image format built for data transfer, developed by CompuServe and released on 15th of June, 1987. This is a format that predates me. At the same time, memory was at a premium in 1987. So how could users access and send files to each other, specifically image files, without locking up all of their computer's memory? Well, Steve, Steve Wilhite and his team centered the GIF around the lempel ziv welch compression algorithm. And as we go along, you'll see that image formats and compression algorithms practically go hand in hand. MacPaint used something called run length encoding, which combined repeated data into a shorter single data value and count. This was great for black and white images, which was pretty much what the MacPaint could achieve, but it couldn't do color very well. Now, I won't go into the actual details of the LZW algorithm, but it encodes the image by creating a dictionary of repeated sequences of colors and could achieve much better compression rates than any prior image format. The first photo of a band ever published on the internet was a pro promotional shot for, I'm gonna try, Les Horribles Cernets. I, I, do I look like I can speak French? The answer is no. But it, they were a particle physics parody pop group at CERN, and I don't think people need to guess what format this photo in, it was a GIF. And this was back in 1992 on the World Wide Web browser, so it's definitely no surprise that when Mosaic came out in 1993, it shipped with support for two image formats, GIF and JPEG. Now, JPEG is both the name of the committee that created the JPEG standard as well as the name of the image compression algorithm itself. And Yon, who is coming up immediately after this, is a member of that committee and will tell you more about it and what they do. And we swapped slots because I'm talking about the past and present, and he's going to be covering what we have now and what's to come in the future. So stay tuned. Now, JPEG was revolutionary when it was released in 1992, and a lot of the information I cover here I learned from Colt McAnlis, who wrote a really in-depth explainer on how JPEG works, and if you're interested in this stuff, you should really read that article as well. Now, JPEG converts from RGB to a YCBCR color model, comprising of luminance, chroma blue, and chroma red. This works because we as human beings, we notice luminance more distinctly than chrominance, and we can get away with more aggressive changes to the CBCR channels. Now, the CBCR channels, they don't have as much detail as the Y channel. They contain less information. And so what the algorithm does is it resizes the CB and CR channels to a fraction of their original size, and this is known as downsampling. Now, this process is lossy, so we won't be able to recover the exact source colors anymore. The math is centered around something called a discrete cosine transform, DCT, where the idea is that any 8 by 8 block can be represented as the sum of weighted cosine transforms at various frequencies. And after applying the requisite formula and basic functions, we end up with a matrix of 64 coefficients. The uppermost left coefficient is called DC, while the other 63 coefficients, they're called AC. And the data has transformed from a spatial to a frequency domain. Now, after this conversion, the coefficients are now real numbers instead of byte-aligned integer values, causing a bloat from one byte to four bytes. So it's necessary for a quantization phase. Now, JPEG uses a pre-calculated matrix of quantization factors instead of directly converting the weights matrix back into a 0 to 55 number space. The final matrix will end up with a large number of entries that are small values or zero, which compress really well. And the matrix of quantization factors can be controlled by changing the quality level of your JPEG. So by now you might notice that a large number of zeros are 
sort of weighted towards the bottom right of this matrix. So a zigzag algorithm is applied to create a linear array of values from the block. And after such a reordering, further compression with techniques like run length encoding yield even better results. The full process of generating a JPEG file involves more steps than what I outlined, but that was my general understanding of how JPEG compression works. And if you have any further questions about JPEG, Jon is clearly the most qualified person to answer all of them. <laughs> now, JPEG does extremely well with photographic images and great effects, like gradients, but not as well with line drawings or graphics with sharp contrast between the pixels. An interesting feature of JPEGs is the option of progressive JPEGs. And I learned about progressive JPEGs from John, in fact, when I read his article called Progressive JPEGs and Green Martians. Non-progressive JPEGs encode all the coefficients of each 8x8 eight eight block sequentially. Instead of doing that, we can encode all the DC coefficients first, and then some low-frequency AC coefficients followed by all the high-frequency AC coefficients last. Progressive JPEGs require the encoder and decoder to make multiple passes through the image, and a typical progressive JPEG has about 10 scans. So as the image gets decoded, you'll see a blurry image get progressively sharper as the image loads. So based on our newfound understanding of JPEG, there are a couple of tips we can use to reduce the size of our JPEG files without significantly compromising quality. And these tips are from the creator of the Compress or Die image optimization tool, Christoph Ertmann. Now, ideally, tip zero is to use an optimization tool, preferably one that you can automate. And following a bit more on the manual side of things, first tip, relatively straightforward, because JPEG is lossy. If your source had already been compressed with lossy algorithms before, your end result is not going to end up well at all. So use a lossless source file, like ping, for example. Now, the second tip I found very interesting because it involves aligning the sharp edges of your image to the grid to help the JPEG algorithm not take patterns from the DCT patterns table that were intended for flat areas. Now, the image on the left is aligned on grid, while the image on the right is just slightly misaligned. The content is essentially the same, but the file size for the aligned graphic end up being more than 20% smaller, and you might not be able to discern the difference very well, but the box edges for the first image are much sharper. If you do edit your own images, you might realize that your image editing software does not support this YCVCR color model that I was mentioning. But most image software do support a color model called LAB, which stands for lightness, red, green, and blue, yellow, respectively. Reducing the contrast of an image lowers the differences between the data in the lightness channel, while a reduction in saturation corresponds to a contrast change in the color channels. Of course, the amount of tweaking that you'd be able to do depends a lot on the art direction that you're going for. And it's also good to keep in mind that changes in the lightness channel do have a greater impact than in the color channels. So contrast has a bigger impact than saturation. Just something to note. Another pretty smart trick is to just get rid of the color information altogether and then colorize the image with CSS, with properties like filter or even in combination with blend modes. Now, if blend modes are your thing, you must check out Yuna Kravitz's amazing talk on blend modes. Link is in the slides. I'll share them later. Or you could put in more manual effort and explicitly smooth out the sharp transitions in the color channels, which will improve savings during the downsampling phase, or you could just do what I did, apply a simple Gaussian blur on parts of the image that aren't important, you know, like the background, because nobody cares about the background, you just want to see the face of Michelle Yeoh. Now, a it's a lazier way, but you still do benefit from some data savings as well, and if you can see from the numbers, it's, it's a pretty significant saving. Now, you don't have to apply all of these tips to all of your images, because it really does depend on the context in which your images are appearing in, but it's good to know what options are available to you. Although JPEG had some patent issues, it is a standard, and developers are free to attend improvements on the compression algorithms. Now, depending on what their end goal is, this may differ between implementations. I mean, you could try to make it faster by reducing the encoding time, you could go for reducing file size as much as possible, 
or you can go for image quality, which is a bit more tricky, but I consider it the uh, let's see how much visual information you can get away with tossing out factor. But you cannot have them all. Now, libjpg is the original JPEG encoder written in C and is distributed under a custom permissive license. Since then, it has been forked and improved upon with encoders like MossJPEG, which targeted images on the web. Specifically, they do some interesting stuff like trellis quantization, which I cannot explain, but they do make the file size smaller at the expense of encoding time. Gootsly, which is really nice to say, if you try saying it, Gootsly, it was released by Google with a focus on image quality as well, but apparently it's, mm, it's, it's really a lot slower than most JPEG, so I, you know, trade-offs, right? Libpeg, LibJPEG Turbo is an open source JPEG image codec, which is used by a large number of applications and operating systems. For example, Chrome has been using it since version 11. Firefox has been using it since version five. I'm not too sure what WebKit does. Maybe they're still on LibJPEG. Um, but while I was trying to figure out image encoders in general and trying to figure out which image encoders GIF used, I managed to unearth the story of how Ping came about. And if you already know the story, please grant me your patience while I try to summarize this. this I find it very juicy. So, turns out the LZW compression algorithm was patented by a company called Unisys back in 1985. But when CompuServe used it to power GIF, they didn't know about this patent status. And Unisys didn't make any moves until 1993, until Mosaic came out. So they're a bit sneaky. And if you squinted really hard at my slides when I first mentioned GIFs, you may have noticed that in the background, the specification said GIF 87A. GIF 89A is an extension that added features like transparency and more crucially, the ability to animate your GIF. And animated GIFs have had enormous staying power. I know Amy said that they're dying, but they are dying, not dead. And seeing as I've sent more than just a handful this morning, I think they're mm, still hanging in there. And they've been all the rage on the web the moment browsers started to support them. But in 1994, Unisys decided to enforce its patent. By December of 1994, a court agreement between Unisys and CompuServe resulted in the announcement that Unisys would start collecting royalties from all software makers who used the GIF 89A format. Outrage ensued, and in stepped in the League for Programming Freedom and their idea to burn all GIFs on November 5th of 1999. I didn't even know this was a thing. But there was also a concrete plan developing on a Usenet news group, comp.graphics, on alternatives to the GIF format. Now, they came up with a little something called Portable Network Graphics. It was shortened from the proposed PING, like P-I-N-G, and it stood for PING is not GIF. And these, these people, really creative, super. Like, another suggestion was actually TNT, and it stood for the new thing. I'm like, this is entertainment. Now, Ping's outperformed GIFs in a multitude of ways. It was 100% open source, it was patent free, it could support thousands of colors versus GIFs 256, it handled transparency better. So good, but the designers of Ping made a conscious decision not to provide animation capabilities. And I'm pretty sure that's what kept the GIF alive all these years because there was no viable alternative to animated GIFs until like nowadays we have MP4. And in contrast to JPEG, ping compression is lossless. It is a two-part process. So there's something called delta encoding, which is a way of storing or transferring data via differences between sequential data instead of complete files. So it's, it's diffing, you know, essentially. And this is advantageous for compression where the data you're dealing with is linearly correlated. So the differences in values will end up being repeated low values. And before compression, Filter algorithms are used to prepare the image data for optimal compression. For each scan line of pixels, the current pixel is encoded in relation to the pixel on its left, we'll call it A, the pixel directly above it, we'll call it B, and to its top left, and we'll call it C. 
So these filters are not done per pixel, though. They're done per channel. So it's like you do all the red values first, and all the blue values, and then all the green. Developers of Ping also came up with some general rules of thumb to select the best filter based on the type of image being processed. Now, after all the filtering is done, the actual compression takes place using a, the deflate algorithm, which is also used in other files like gzip compressed files and zip files. And again, uh, Colt McAnalyst had yet another in-depth explainer on how Ping works this time. And in it, he highlights that the nature of image data brings about some very interesting caveats when using deflate. Specifically, how the exact dimensions of your image could have an impact on how well image compression works. So if you look at this illustration, you'll see two nearly identical images of kiwi fruits. only that the image on the right is two pixels wider, just two. Now, for the smaller image, the bytes representing the second and third kiwis fell between the LZ match range and are encoded as highly efficient LZ matches, resulting in the dark blue thermal pattern you can see on the thermal scans on the right. But somehow, the extra two columns of pixels in the right image resulted in the bytes for the second and third kiwis to be out of match range and they're encoded as non-matching. And it just caused the file size to bloat dramatically, more than double. So this is pretty fascinating to me. But pings are a regularly used format on the web. So let's also go through some tips on how to keep their file sizes down. Again, if you can, use a tool. Automate all of the things. But if you had to do some manual tweaking, one way to reduce the file size of your pings is by reducing the number of unique colors within the image, because this impacts on the filtering stage, where a lower difference between adjacent pixels will decrease the range of values output from the filtering process. And with more duplicate values, deflate can compress better. However, this makes it a lossy process, because you're taking away colors, which is why your human eye is absolutely required if you do want to take this approach. You have to have a human judge the end result, because our current tools are still unable to discern visual quality at a level acceptable to human perception. For now. Also, if you're not using transparency in your image, then don't even bother with RGBA 32 bits per pixel. You could use a 24 bits per pixel true color format, or, you know, try a JPEG. Why not? And if you're doing grayscale images, eight bits per pixel will suffice. If your image is neither a photograph or nor contains lots of gradients, you could consider changing the color mode to indexed and this will generate a reduced palette of colors from your source image. What we're doing here is we're increasing the odds that adjacent pixels are pointing to the same color, resulting in even more duplicate values at the end of the filtering process. So more duplicate values, better compression, smaller file size. And given the substantial amount of savings, it might be worth it to do an inventory of your images to see if you can get away with such a conversion at scale. And say you need to crop out large source of background out of a logo image or something of that sort, you could try assigning transparency to selected color values in the indexed color table. And then when the image is decoded in memory, the transparency will be set accordingly. But you, you can only do this for images in indexed mode. And if you're stuck using full RGB, make sure the bits of the image which end up being alpha out are of a single color. Because if you leave parts of the image under the mask as is, even though your users won't see those pixels, they will definitely feel them. Because those pixels still get processed during the encoding process. LipPing is the official ping reference library, and it's what Firefox and Chrome use for ping support. So earlier I mentioned LipJPEG Turbo as kind of a segue into pings, but we really ought to talk about what these image encoders uh, behave in relation to browser rendering engines. Uh, first of all, I'd like to clarify that I am not a browser engineer. In fact, very far from it. I know a C++ program when I see one. That's it. So this, this, this next bit here is not going to be too technical. But if you are a browser engineer, happen to be one, I would love to pick your brain after this, so, so, so come chat. <laughs> 
Now, Poch, developer advocate at Mozilla, he wrote this awesome article about Project Quantum and browser engines when Firefox was doing its big core engine overhaul back in 2017. And most web developers, myself included, we see the browser engine as this magical black box that somehow turns the code we write into websites that our users can somehow consume, even if they're on a different browser, they're a different device, a different time zone. Browser engines combine the structure and style of a web page to draw it on the screen and then figure out which parts are interactive. So as you can see, there are a lot of parsers and dedicated engines to do all of that work. And today I was planning to cover two portions of this diagram. So far we've touched the blue circled portion bit about images, uh, about media, specifically images, and considering how much work the browser has to do, it makes sense that the image encoding and decoding part of things are generally taken care of by third-party libraries, some of which we've already covered. Now, both Chromium and Gecko have their source code available on GitHub, so we can like, kind of dig in and sort of find the encoders that they are using. So by now, we've really covered a lot about image data, and I want to move further down the pipeline to when that image data, together with pixel data from other sources gets painted onto the screen because that part is really fascinating. Nicholas Silva, who leads the Firefox GFX team, was a great help because he explained a lot of this stuff to me. Now, although each browser engine does things differently, the general idea behind a modern rendering pipeline involves the layout computation into a frame tree, generation of drawing commands into something called a display list, the painting of portions of that display list into layers, and finally, combining all those layers into one final image through compositing. Because the displays that we use now are all raster displays, it is necessary for a rasterization process to occur before graphics can be displayed on a screen. Decoded images are generally already in a raster format, but vector graphics or fonts have to be expressed as pixels as well. For anyone who's not a browser engineer like me, I highly recommend going through this series of articles on how to build a browser engine by Matt Brubeck. He's a research engineer with Mozilla and works on Servo. Now, Servo, for anyone who hasn't heard of it before, it is a prototype web browser engine written in Rust by the team at Mozilla, and it's essentially a new rendering engine, and Mozilla is gradually replacing parts of the old Gecko code, which has been around for a really long time, with the stable parts of Servo, and that's what Project Quantum is all about. The first version of Firefox with the Servo component enabled was 57, that was back in 2017, and since then, more and more Servo has been making its way into Firefox. Now, Matt built his toy browser engine in a language called Rust. It is open sourced, it's available on GitHub, and he chose to write his own rasterizer, which only paints solid rectangles. But from this, we can sort of see how browser engines paint image data from memory onto the screen. Personally, I don't write Rust. I don't know what it is. I'm a JavaScript person. But the code is relatively understandable when he explains it in his article. And we're only going to be looking at the paint portion of this toy browser engine. So here we can see that all the pixels are going to be stored in a canvas. Now, painting a rectangle onto a canvas involves looping through the rows and columns of the canvas. So this is simply a helper method to ensure that the loop doesn't go out of bounds of the canvas. But this is the actual paint function, which builds the display list. And the build display list I did not actually display here. But it builds the display list, and it paints the data to the canvas pixel by pixel, line by line, until the entire canvas is filled up. Now, like I mentioned, this particular implementation only supports solid colors, because if you wanted to do something like, say, transparency, it would require additional blending to calculate the pixel color values, because at the end of the day, everything is just numbers, right? Now, Matt had given a short talk at the Bay Area Rust meetup where he talked about this project, and he gave an excellent answer to the question, hey, so what's your graphics bucket? It's an array. It's an array and a for loop. That is the graphics backend. Of course, commercial browsers make use of graphics APIs and libraries to implement rasterization, because clearly what we expect from the web is much more than just solid colored rectangles. Browser makers need functions for rendering text, for polygons, lines, gradients, curves, you know, all of those things. 
And this is just a list of common graphics libraries currently being used to power popular browser engines. Chrome uses the Skia graphics library almost exclusively for all graphics operations, even text rendering. Firefox used to use something called Core Graphics in Cairo, but eventually simplified the number of backends they ran on. And after the smoke clears on their huge engine overhaul, Firefox will eventually use Skia for Canvas and Web Render for everything else. Safari, which is based on WebKit, used to use Apple's core image libraries, but honestly, I'm not quite sure what they use right this minute. But the concept of painting still remains the same, with displays accessing the frame buffer for information on every pixel that needs to be displayed onto the screen in an RGBA format. A frame is considered completely rendered when all the pixels have been filled in by the renderer. And this process is constantly being repeated every time something on the page changes. But most of the time, only a part of the screen is changing, and browsers will figure out what changed and only update those relevant pixels, and this is called invalidation. Now, invalidation as an optimization technique has been around since the early browsers, but they can only get us so far. Though invalidation techniques work well for small changes, like maybe you know, a carrot blinking on an input field, for sweeping changes affecting most of the screen, we required something a little bit more. Browser engineers then came up with the idea of having layers. With layers, the browser would only have to repaint the layer which changed, or sometimes just you know, rearrange the layers, as is the case when you're trying to scroll a page. For scrolling, the compositing process starts with a bunch of source bitmaps and then a target bitmap, which is what eventually ends up getting displayed on the screen. The compositor will copy the layers that remain unchanged, like maybe the background over to the destination bitmap, and then it's going to figure out which part of the scrollable content needs to be visible and then copy that bit over to the destination as well. The compositor is also responsible for applying the necessary transformations depending on the layer's CSS transform properties to each compositing layer's bitmap before compositing it. Now, having layers means that when the browser invalidates a layer, only the contents of that layer needs to be repainted and then recomposited. It used to be that all the work on the rendering pipeline was done by the CPU on the main thread. But the CPU has a task list from here to the moon and back. It is a very busy piece of hardware. Graphics processing units, or GPUs, used to be the domain of video games. But now they're pretty much a general purpose technology and an integral part of computer architecture. I mean, even most of your phones have GPUs now. And GPUs have exceptional parallel processing capabilities, and they're really good at rendering frames fast. So the next thing browser engineers did was to move rendering tasks to the GPU. For our current browser landscape, paint and composite are relatively separate processes in all the major browsers, and browser engineers are trying to move both of them off of the main thread. But as it turns out, it's much easier to move compositing to the GPU because GPUs are great at blitting quads. Now, blitting is the process of combining several bitmaps into one with a Boolean function. Paint, on the other hand, is trickier to move because the GPU is not necessarily good at painting all of the things. It's really fast for blitting surfaces, but not great for drawing Bezier curves and shapes, for example. Text rendering also isn't that great on the GPU. The Chromium project has a very detailed design documentation which outlined exactly what goes on under the hood with Blink and CC, which is the Chrome compositor. In Chromium, the page, I'm not sure if you can see it very clearly, uh, the lines are too faint, but the page is divided up into tiles of 256 by 256 pixels for more efficient rasterization. Paint commands, which don't impact certain tiles, they just get ignored, and only the tiles that need to get updated will be rasterized again. And the old way that Chrome used to do to rasterize a tile made use of the Skia library, which uses a scanline algorithm to create a bitmap that is sent to the GPU to be drawn on the screen. The new method, though, also executed by Skia, but with a GPU backend called Ganesh. Now, it's faster because there's, not that, there's no copying involved between the CPU and the GPU. But the challenge of having the GPU rasterize small, complicated shapes, like fonts, 
It's not trivial at all, especially for CJK languages with upwards of thousands of glyphs. So it seems that both the CPU and the GPU still have their roles to play in the rasterization process. Browser rendering engines were designed at a time when GPUs were not commonplace outside gaming machines, and CPUs didn't have as many cores as they do now, and at a time where you know, websites weren't really all that complicated. And historically, 2D graphics APIs like Cairo and Skia, they're focused on the 2D rendering side of things. But the web platform evolved. And we started to do things like animations and perspective transforms in the browser. To offer first-class support to such capabilities, browsers added them at the compositor level. Because it was simply hard or inadequate to do so using such graphics APIs like Cairo or Skia. Essentially, browser engines were improved upon based on their existing implementation as computer hardware evolved. Developments such as separating paint and compositing, they were part of that improvement. Which is why Web Render is such an interesting project, because it is a 2D renderer for the web that started out as Servo's graphics engine. Now, Web Render removes the separation between paint and composite instead makes use of the GPU's exceptional parallel processing power to handle the painting and compositing in a single step through various techniques that make use of the display list. And because web render was written from scratch for the needs of modern web specifications, functionalities like animation and 3D were built directly in at the same level as 2D rendering primitives. Lynn Clark, who writes the best technical articles ever, has a very in-depth and easy-to-read article on MOSHEX on the details of how web render works. And that was the basis for a lot of the stuff that I explained. And I think that the developments happening around web render are really cool. And if you would like to follow along as well, the Mozilla GFX team also maintains a blog with project updates and explainers on exactly what goes on underneath the hood. So I'm really grateful to all these beautiful people who gave me time of day and either answered my noob questions on browser rendering or took the effort to point me in the right direction. Even though they're not here right now, I'd like to say a big thank you to all of them. And I also read a lot more than is on here, so, but this list only contains the links to what I actually reference in the talk. So all, if all this is as fascinating to you as it is me, um, come chat. I'll share my longer list of resources with you as well. Now, I love the web, truly. And I know that it takes many different groups of people who contribute in their own way that makes the web what it is. But today, I want to show my appreciation for browser engineers. Some of them have made this their full-time careers. Others have done so as OSS contributors in their own time. But even though browsers are not the only way to access information on the web, they are the predominant medium at the moment. So I just want to say thank you, browser engineers everywhere, for striving to make the web experience smoother, faster, and more accessible for all of us. And thank all of you for your attention.